light on the country's courtroom language challenges. Following the language challenges faced by advocate for the accused, Malisa Ladefu, and the state witness, Tabo Mosia, forensic and legal linguists say the country's Legal Practice Act and the Legal Practice Council fail to address the language question for courtroom communication. They are calling mother tongue, uh, for mother tongue to be embraced in courtroom uh, discourse. For more on this, I'm joined now by the author of that article, uh, Dr. Zakira Dokrat. Uh, thank you for joining me, Doc, and I thank you for your time. Uh, this comes from the conversation, of course, which is a great platform uh, for academics and others and practitioners to actually, um, you know, bring to the public limelight some of the nuanced conversations that are quite specialist but can actually become a conversation as the name of the title suggests uh, for all of us. What are your main observations that have come through from the Senzo Meiwa trial about what's problematic about the use of language? I want you to sum it up. We had an introduction but I believe you would do an even better job in summing up what the observations are that have come through from this trial. Good afternoon to the and good afternoon to the, the viewers. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, I might also add before I start that this is actually a co-authored article um, with my colleague, Professor Russell Kishila. Um, it's very complex, but I think, you know, the Mehiwa case shines the, the spotlight on language and courtroom discourse, specifically from the point of legal practitioners, as you rightly point out. Um, from the point of uh, judicial officers and their sensitivity to language usage or the lack thereof, um, from a point of interpretation, and also the failures within the South African police force and the language difficulties faced there as well, Tillis where. Yeah, and so let's start from the level of the uh, legal practitioners in court there, um, and, and, and social media is sometimes a buzz with uh, people sort of taking the mickey out of the situation, particularly in as far as advocate uh, Melissa Ladefu uh, is concerned. You believe um, that, that that should not be the, the, the approach. I, I don't know, we can't control what people do with it, but you believe the challenges faced there, particularly as they relate to the legal practitioners in that courtroom, speak to how these processes are undertaken in court? Yes, definitely. I mean, we saw how Advocate Tefo ran out of words, you know, just to put it simply, um, English, English words. And it was not a lack of his vocabulary um, per se, but a lack of the English language on his part. And, and as you say, you know, people were quick to jump to social media and insult Advocate Tefo in some instances and say, you know, it's, it's almost an insult on his intelligence to say um, he lacks some sort of intelligence as a legal practitioner and, and even question his qualifications because of English. And this is what we do in South Africa, Tulisis, where unfortunately we judge people on the use of their English language, the use of their vocabulary in English, and then we assign intelligence to that. And that's wholly unfortunate in a multilingual country such as South Africa, where only 9.6% of our population speak English. And I think what exasperated the whole situation was the fact that um, the judge uh, presiding over the matter actually giggled and laughed. Uh, in response to Advocate Tefo uh, running out of English words. And I know sometimes we have inappropriate reactions, but not within a courtroom setting. That, that just cannot happen, uh, especially where the judge is also an African language speaker. You'd expect some sort of sensitivity in the matter. Yeah. Was it even an option, um, Zakira, for Advocate Tefo to say, you know, I'm most comfortable in Sibedi and I'm going to make my arguments in Sibedi and just like happens with witnesses, uh, translation should happen in that instance or is that option not available at all uh, with the result that English and perhaps Afrikaans continue to be the languages of record in our courts? Yes, um, look, that is just not an option, Tila Sizwe, given the 2017 language of record policy decision that was taken by our heads of court. Uh, to make English the sole official language of record. So legal practitioners are obligated to address the court in English um, and all proceedings happen in English, except where a witness needs to give evidence in a language other than English. Um, but then the record still reflects what the interpreter says in English. Um, to go back to, to what you said about English and Afrikaans, 
I think to note also for the viewers that Afrikaans is no longer a language of record I in see. our courts, which is also very disappointing. Yeah. And people also ask me, you know, why would I say it's disappointing given what's happening with rain air and the history of Afrikaans and all? But we must understand that Afrikaans is also a large, sp largest spoken language in South Africa. And it's not only spoken by majority white people. It's spoken by a lot of colored people and black people in South Africa. And we need to acknowledge that. And I think we need to move past the history as well of Afrikaans being used um, as a language of oppression and see it as an equal language. Um, but that aside, English is the sole official language of record. And it, it creates such an issue in courts as we've seen with Advocate Tefal, because you could just see the urge and the need for Advocate Tefal to actually use his mother tongue. Yeah. And he was unable to do so. You know, and unfortunately, this is what a policy, the effect of a policy does on practical courtroom discourse. Are there glimmers of hope, um, Zakira? And, and, and I'm speaking here specifically about one instance, which I must say it's quite disappointing that it had to take um, Justice uh, Mandisa Maya to be the first judge to write an, a judgment entirely in this cause. Um, and, and, and it was an important step for her to have taken that step to do that. But I'm saying disappointing in the sense that, you know, I, I, I don't imagine that there's a bar to judgments being penned entirely in, 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 in the rest of the South African, um, you know, uh, official languages. Yes, look, um, President Mani Samaya is amazing in how she promotes the use of the African languages, particularly Iskosa, obviously. Um, and we commend her for that and we encourage her. And she's actually encouraged other judges to use their mother tongue. And we've seen it coming through in the Constitutional Court with Justice Froneman writing in Afrikaans as well. And where it appears bilingually to La Cizwe. I think, you know, I must push this point um, before I get back to your question about the importance of writing judgments bilingually, using the African language, Afrikaans, alongside English equally. That is what we are advocating for, not to get rid of English and replace it with the African languages. We don't want to replace one language with another. We want to create language equality um, between the speakers of the languages and yeah. between the languages themselves. Um, but as for judgment writing, there's nothing prohibiting a judge writing in their mother tongue. Um, but again, it goes back to this language of record to us and, you know, the, the impact that it has uh, on judges themselves. Because if proceedings are happening in English, then how is a judge going to write in their mother tongue? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially when we're looking at magistrates court proceedings, which are your lower courts and at your higher courts, it's, it's often easier then for the judicial officer to just write the judgment in English because the record appears before uh, him or her in English. So policy and legislation dictate how, how we operate, how we control ourselves in court, our, our communicative abilities. And I think it, it's, it's for the legislature, it's for the judiciary, mm. um, specifically the heads of court, and more so the minister of justice. Because it's, it's my point of view that this language of record policy can only be formulated by the minister and, in fact, not by the heads of court. So we need to see some active, um, uh, some active uh, judicial profiling in, in, in the sure. sense of language, what is happening in our courts. And, and that's what I mean by judicial profiling. You know, what are the profiles of our judicial officers? Um, what are their competencies? And, and we are not saying that we should be shopping for judges in any way. Yeah. I'm not saying put a judge there purely because he or she can speak an African language. All right. And I think that also needs to raise to us because we often assign the African languages with rest. So nobody's suspecting here today with you interviewing me yeah. that I speak a close of fluently because it's not thought of because I'm not black in a sense. Mm. Um, so this is what we need to also understand and collectively own um, from a point of politics from a point of social justice, from a point of forensic linguistics, that our language belong to us collectively, and we need to own these. Yeah. All right. Now, that's a fascinating conversation that you have started. So the way I understand it, a key way of addressing it would certainly have to do with addressing the language of record policy. That would be a starting point, but there are many, many barriers to, to, to demolish uh, in, 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 in achieving uh, that linguistic equality that you talk of. Thank you for that. Thank you for your inputs there. That's Dr. Zakira Dokrat, who is a forensic and legal linguist uh, and researcher.
literature, uh, you should look out for that article. It's actually on the uh, publication, The Conversation. Just search it up uh, and hear some of her and her co-authors thoughts about what they've been observing around the Senzo Meiwa trial as it's been ongoing.